Hello, welcome back. The next uh, ratio we want to look at are the um, efficiency ratio or turnover ratios. This ratio tells us how much, uh, how much is the asset being utilized in the firm. So it's also called asset utilization ratio. Um, the first ratio is infantry turnover. It's defined as cost of goods sold divided by infantry. The numerator cost of goods sold is located in the income statement. So the cost of goods sold for this company is $580,000. That's relatively straightforward. The denominator, as we discussed earlier, is a little bit trickier because infantry is a balance sheet item. So should we use infantry for 2015 or should we use 2016 or should we compute the average? And the answer again goes back to, it depends on the, the firm. Is the firm in, uh, increasing in size, decreasing in size, or is increasing in size so fast that it warrants using the average? So I'll go over uh, both cases. In the first case, we're gonna use the average. So if we are gonna use the average as the denominator, we need to compute the average inventory. So you have 420,000 plus 480,000, divided by two. So if you're using the average, you can, you, and our calculations show that the average infantry turns out to be, when you add the two divided by and compute the average, is And we get an infantry turnover ratio of 1.282. Okay, I fixed the writing problem. So the ratio is 1.2818. More importantly is what does this number mean? So this number means that we turn over our infantry 1.2818 times um, during the year. So this is, uh, this is how we will use um, the average number to compute our ratios. Uh, for, the simplicity, for the simplicity of calculation and for practice, for the rest of this demonstration and also in, um, if you're asked to do the calculation, you'll be very clear to, um, to tell whether or not to use the beginning number, the ending number, or the average number. Uh, so again, to minimize calculation, again, I want to focus on the concept rather than the detail arithmetic, uh, we'll use the ending number uh, for most of our calculation from this point on. So we'll just um, assume that the ending number is, is sufficient for our analysis. So if we are gonna use our ending number in computing the infantry turnover, We'll, instead of using the average, we're gonna use the ending balance of infantry, which is $485,000. And that will give us an infantry turnover of 1.1959. Okay. So the, as you can see, the difference in this case is not a whole lot. Now, what does that number mean? So again, we bring, we comes back to each time we do a calculation, it's important to ask why are we calculating that number? Why is that ratio important? And what does the number tell us? So in this case, um, infantry turnover, you say we turn over our infantry 1.195 times. Um, what does that signify? Well, and a number that help us understand that better is days sales in infantry which is based on infantry turnover. So there are 365 days in a year. So we said that our 365 days, we divide that by the infantry turnover. We turn over our infantry 1.1959 times, and that is 305 days. What does that mean? That means that our infantry sits on our shelf for an average of 305 days before it gets sold. So um, is that long shot? It really depends on the industry that your company is in. 
if you are selling diamond rings, that may not be too bad. A diamond ring may sit in the shelf for 300 days before somebody comes by to buy it, uh, antique shop. Uh, but if you are running a grocery store, then you will be in serious, serious trouble because most of your items will be um, will be useless, will be spoiled and um, not not sellable after 305 days. So this this number obviously will help you um, interpret the information a lot easier than 1.1959 um, times per year. Next, we're going to compute the receivable turnover ratio and days sales and receivable. Um, once again, we're going to use just the 2016 number for accounts receivable. So I'm going to ask you to pause the video and perform, the cal to perform this calculation. So you need to find out what sales is, divide that by accounts receivable, and then also compute days sales in receivables. Did you get 2.6852 times? Terrific. And day sales and receivable, another name for that is average collection period. This represents how long does it take on average for you to collect cash from a customer. And in this case, it turns out to be 136 days. So again, that, that's very long, right? Because it takes, you only get, if you are thinking about a typical bill of sales, which is net 30, that means you expect the customers to pay you within 30 days. Here, your customers are not paying you for 136 days. So it depends on, again, the industry. There may be some special industry where that is a typical sales period and the day sales in inventory uh, would last as long as 305 days because you're an antique jewelry dealer um, or an art gallery. Um, on the other hand, if you're running an, um, a convenience store or a grocery store, um, this number will be um, 0 0.5 days because most people, or, or, or less than that because most people will pay cash or pay by debit or credit card on the spot. So the, 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 the receivable will be negligible. Finally, we're going to compute the total asset turnover. So for the total asset turnover, we have sales divided by total asset. A number that's very closely related to that is called capital intensity. Notice that it's just the reverse. So what that means is that total asset turnover is the inverse of capital intensity. This number is important because we talk about a company who might be approach, approaching capacity. So we want to see how does its um, sales utilization, total asset turnover, or capital intensity compared to it, the industry average. So go ahead again, once again, pause the video and perform this calculation. Welcome back. Did you get 0 0.2745 times? So that means um, you turn over your asset less than once, in fact, less than one third times per year. Um, capital intensity um, is the inverse of that. So that tells you um, how much asset you, you, gen you, you need or you utilize to generate $1 of sales. Next, we're going to compute profitability measures. Now, in our example, we have both common stock and um, preferred stock. So we will use net income available to common stock in our calculations. Again, that's more common um, and that's um, also more important because common stock holders are the ones who have voting rights. And if you're buying a stock, typically you're buying a share of common stocks and not preferred stock. So first, we want to compute uh, the profit margins. So profit margin is defined as net income divided by sales. So again, remember that all net income, we're, we're using net income available to common stockholders. So net income will be 100, profit margin is net income of $166,550 divided by 800 uh, total sales, 
which is $850,000. And that gave us a net income of 0.1959 or 19.59%. So that's a really high profit margin of 19.59%. The next two ratios is net income. Again, we're going to use net income available to common stockholders divided by total asset and divided by total equity. Um, total asset is relatively straightforward. Total asset is in the financial is in the balance sheet, and the total asset for this firm is three three million nine hundred sixty five thousand five hundred fifty dollars. So, if you divide net income by total asset, um, we will get a return on asset or ROI of 5.38%. So again, make sure that you check the calculation. The last one is the one that I want to pay a little bit more attention to. The last one is defines return on equity. Notice that we are using net income available to common stockholder. So when we divide that by total equity, we want to make sure that we are dividing that by common equity as well. So the denominator for ROE is total common equity, the $2,256,650. Again, the emphasis here is to match common stockholder earnings to common stock equity. And the return on equity turns out to be 7.38% or 0.0738. So that's return on common equity. So that's the profitability ratio for this company. The last set of ratio, um, market value ratio. This, this is a set of ratio that help us an answer the questions, is this, a good is this company a good investment? In addition to whether or not this company is a good company. One characteristics of market value ratio is that we tend to convert all the values to a per share basis. And the reason for that is because as an individual stockholders, you're going to buy one share or 100 shares of a company, but you're not going to buy the entire company. So it makes sense to convert all the values to a per share basis. Uh, more importantly, stock price is always quoted on a per, per share basis. So the price of the stock, the price per share in this case, or the market value per share, Remember that price and market value means the same thing. So you may see the price of a company that is exactly equal to the market value of the company. So these two terms is actually referring to the same thing. In our example, both of them is $75 per share. Now let's look at the denominator. The Den denominator for the first ratio, the PE ratio, P, uh, price earnings ratio. So oftentimes this is abbreviated as PE. The price earnings ratio is divide, defined as price divided by earnings per share. So what is our earnings per share? Uh, earnings is another name for net income, net earnings and net income. So earnings per share, oftentimes abbreviated as EPS. Earnings per share we have, again, this time we are working, we are using common stockholder. So common equity, we have $166,550 altogether. And that, ha that belongs to 20,000 shareholders. So on a per share basis, that means our earnings per share is $8.32.75. And now we can compute the price earnings ratio. The price earnings ratio is $75 is our stock price divided by the earnings per share of $8.32.75. That gives us a PE ratio of not approximately nine, 9.0063 times. So that's our PE ratio. Uh, is that high or low? Again, we need to compare that to the market average and average for the industry. Um, this is where the market history, capital market history comes into play. We have seen the average return on the stock market. We have also seen the average earnings per share for the market. We, all have, we also have seen the average price earnings ratio for the market. Uh, nine is relatively low. Um, 
from a historical perspective. Again, that need to be adjusted for the industry effect. Uh, the market to book ratio is computed in a similar way to compute the market to book ratio we need to have the we already have the price of the stock which is $75 we, are, we need to compute the book value per share so book value per share is defined as the book value of common equity so again we have to keep in mind which um, equity account we are working with so most common we are working with the common equity account so we need to find the common equity account and convert it into a per share numbers. So the common equity account is $2.256 million and we have 20,000 shares outstanding. So to convert that to a per share number, book value of common equity per share, it turns out to be $112 and 8.275 cents. So that's the per share number. So this is our book value per share. We have the price of $75 and we have a book value of uh, $112, 8.8275. We can compute the market to book ratio. So if we divide 75 by 112, it turns out that the market to book ratio is 0 0.6647 times. So again, we need to compare, compare that number to the historic average as well as the industry average, and that will give us an indication on whether or not this is a valuable investment. Now that you have a good mastery and understanding of ratio analysis, let's take it one step further. Let's take a look at if we have a high profit, for example, if you have a high return to equity ratio, what is driving that? Is that sustainable? Um, are there weaknesses in that, in that profitability that we need to pay attention to? And the first person who asked those deeper questions, his name is DuPont, and therefore this analysis is named after that person. It's called the DuPont identity. It takes the insight that he has, and we can use, extend this insight to many different applications, is that return on equity, which is defined as net income divided by equity, can, is made up of different components. In fact, we can expand that. DuPont expand that into three components. The first is net income divided by sales. Net income divided by sales is simply the profit margin. And then the second is sales divided by total asset. And sales divided by total asset is total asset turnover. So that's the second component. And the last component is total asset divided by equity, and that is an equity multiplier. So what does that tell us? The first component, profit margin, measures profitability. The second, total asset turnover, measures the efficiency of the firm. And the last component, equity multiplier, measures leverage. So by looking at ROE, return on equity, in its individual components, the three components, it tells us whether or not ROE, which is a very important um, metric that most companies focus on, is driven by profitability, meaning that is the firm able to charge a higher profit margin. You can think of a company like Apple that charge a, that are able to garner a much higher profit margin for its product than its competitor. Or is it driven by total asset turnover, which is efficiency? Um, Dell computer was no, was very famous for its high efficiency, and it was able to generate profit not because it charges a high premium for its product, uh, so its profit margin is not high, but its total asset turnover is very high, so it's very efficient. And so you can you could generate return on one or either one or both. And then lastly is leverage. Is the company able to generate profit because it used a lot of leverage? Using leverage increases risk. 
So using the Dubon identity will help you identify the strength and weakness of a particular company. So now let's take a look at our example. In our example, we know that the, we have computed the ROE, return on equity. Remember that this is common equity that we use. We know the return on equity is 7.38%. Now let's look at its individual component. We have also computed that earlier on. The profit margin is 19.59%. The total asset turnover is 0.2745. And equity multiplier is 1.3722. So again, I uh, want you to pause the video to make sure that you can, you know, where we computed all of these numbers. So when you go back to your notes, you should have all these computed um, for, for this example. We can, what we are going to do is we can verify that indeed when we multiply the three components together, we get the same answer. We get the return on equity that is make up of these three individual components. So now when you compare these numbers, against the industry average. You can then pinpoint and say the profitability of the firm is driven primarily by one or two of these factors. And that will have implication on the quality of the earning and also the sustainability of the firm's ability to continue uh, to maintain its current uh, profitability. We'll end this video here. We'll continue with um, the last two uh, sections of financial statement analysis next.